I would also now like to introduce our speakers uh, to kick off our day, Dr. Laura Council and Dr. Ama Valeris. Laura Council is the Vice President and Senior Medical Director for Primary Care at Cambridge Health Alliance and a practicing family physician. She received her medical degree from the University of Massachusetts Medical School and her MPH at Dartmouth Institute for Health Policy and Clinical Practice. She completed <clears throat> the NH Dartmouth Family Medicine Residency and the Leadership Preventative Medicine Residency at Dartmouth Hic Hickok, Hitchcock, sorry, and has a master's in healthcare management from Harvard Klan School of Public Health. She is an accomplished leader in ambulatory care with expertise in patient-centered care, delivery, transformation, coordination of care, and standardization of best practices across healthcare systems. Her experience includes using team-based care to achieve goals of enhancing patient experience and delivering population health while reducing costs and improving the work life of healthcare providers and staff. And Dr. Valeris is a faculty member at NH Dartmouth Family Medicine Residency and Leadership Preventative Medicine Residency and works in the Behavioral Health Department at the Concord Hospital Family Health Center. She received her undergraduate and master's of social work degrees from Boston College and her doctorate in social work from Arizona State University. She has presented nationally and internationally on the topics of integrating behavioral health and primary care on disability and illness identity and on qualitative research methodology. Her interests include working with the survivors of domestic violence, addressing isms in the medical environment, and narrative medicine. In her free time, she enjoys being with her three children, hiking and writing. So with that, I will um, have you guys share your screen and you guys can begin your presentation. Thank you. Okay. Let me just, all right, can everyone see the screen okay? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Okay, well, um, thank you for that introduction. I, I want to start also by um, talking a little bit about a piece of my introduction that doesn't go in the professional um, formal one, which is that I also have muscular dystrophy, as does my father and my daughter. And so the Muscular Dystrophy Association has been uh, near and dear to my heart throughout my entire life. Um, and it's a really uh, actually sacred space for me to be invited here today to talk um, with you. I've been in the role of um, not necessarily caregiver in the physical sense, but um, certainly attending so many um, doctor's appointments and hospitalizations and in the role of trying to amplify the voice of um, either my father or daughter or myself. Um, and that's actually a lot of what brought me to my career, uh, which was um, finding ways to push the, the voice of really the expert of the person that lives in the body and the person that lives with the patient into the healthcare team in a more prominent and important and significant and central way. Laura, do you wanna add anything to your intro? Um, it is really great to be invited here uh, today. I've um, known Dr. Valeris for a very long, <clears throat> very long time, um, and actually did not uh, know of her medical condition. Um, and so it really became quite meaningful to be able to partner with her as I do in, in many spaces, um, but uh, particularly to um, be with uh, this particular association today. So. Thank you very much, um, and we really look forward to talking and to interacting with you. Okay, so today we're talking about the um, patient-centered care plan, and uh, we thought we'd start with talking about what um, most medical professionals think of when they think of the term care plan. Originally, this was a tool that was created by um, the medical community as a way, uh, sort of a one-stop shopping for professionals to talk to each other. Um, it often was filled with jargon. It uh, in ways that it wasn't um, translated into patient literacy kinds of terms. Um, it often not not the intent, but the impact was all, often sort of objectifying the patient and talk to, talking about the symptoms 
or the part of the body and sort of squeezing out the whole patient, the personhood, the parts of the person's life impacted by the symptoms. And there really wasn't um, sort of the philosophy of this is a care plan that belongs to the patient and family. It was, um, it's, it's the healthcare team's care plan about the patient and family. Uh, and, and therefore, because the medical world does such a good job at responding to problems, the care plan became something that was filled with um, sort of this problem potential solution, um, rather than really seeing all the strengths, all the survival skills, all the resilience that people um, you know, really have as like, that's what gets them through the day. That's what um, we as healthcare team members could really learn from is how are they living with this, not how are they suffering from this. Uh, and as you may be familiar with the disability community um, back in, you know, and during the advocacy for the Americans with Disabilities Act, the slogan became nothing about us without us. No decisions should be being made about people uh, whose lives are touched by disability without people with disabilities and their loved ones being at the table and in the decision making process. And that feels really relevant to um, sort of the birth of this um, patient-centered care plan that we're talking about today. Laura, did you want to talk about the um, sort of the philosophy behind the care plans from your perspective? <clears throat> so as a, a practicing family physician, um, I am trained uh, as, as all physicians in every specialty are to really think about two things when I'm approaching a patient. One, what is the worst case scenario? And two, what is the most likely scenario? And uh, it's really important that I have a plan to deal with both the worst case and the most likely um, scenarios. And those are things that benefit um, patients and families. But it is not part of my traditional medical training to really think about what is the best case scenario? What are we aiming for? What would be, what would be the goal? Where are we going? Um, where, where does the uh, patient and family um, and caregivers uh, want to be in six months, in a year, in five years? And what, how is my role to be an advocate, um, a helper, uh, give advice and be a guide to get there? When I first came into medicine, the word care plan meant something very, very different to the different specialties in medicine. We did not even have the same vocabulary to talk about um, how to articulate a set of activities around a patient. So as a physician, when I mean care plan, I really am talking about what's my plan for the worst case scenario? <clears throat> what's my general plan um, to take care of problems? Because I work off of a problem list. Nurses uh, are trained to really think about care plans as being related to functions, how people uh, functions, what their functional goals are, and uh, how to work with uh, patients and families to improve functional status. And then I also learned uh, from Amy and others that, you know, in social work, um, care plan or plan of care might even have a different meeting that has a lot to do with um, life skills uh, and life um, goals, interactions with the community, um, interactions uh, interpersonally. And so one of the things that um, I envisioned in uh, this transformation towards team-based patient-centered care would be a document or a tool that let the voice of each person on the medical team be heard and centered on the voice um, of the patients and families uh, as well. And that, that led us um, through this care plan creation. Yeah, so you can see the, um, the pictures of the TV and the computer and the telephone here. Uh, and that's sort of our metaphor for the original care plan. Uh, if you're in my generation or older, these might look familiar to you, um, but we needed something more, um, modern. So here we are, we're at an impasse. We need a new a, a paradigm shift from the healthcare team in order for the um, 
in order for the patients and the family members and the caregivers to have more of a voice in the process of living with this condition. Um, and so systems thinking uh, is the approach that that Laura and I took in creating the patient-centered care plan. And the idea is that if you, you have this whole system and, and if you think of it as a machine with lots of different wheels, if we just tweak one little piece of it, it has an impact on the entire machine as a whole. Um, so thinking about how, how can we get our colleagues to create space in a different way than has ever been done before, but we kept coming up against walls. We were actually getting pretty frustrated um, with, you know, our colleagues were stuck the, and, and we realized that the medical world in, in sort of upholding the, the doctor as the expert and the hero of this narrative has been ingrained in all of us, patients and allied health professionals and family members and patients alike. We all sort of operate in this narrative. And so we, um, we we're working against hundreds of years of socialization to the to this way of thinking. So we thought, well, if we create a tool that we're we're all working on this tool together, then we shift the philosophy, we shift the conversation, and we shift the power dynamic, and we make the patient and the caregiver the hero of the narrative, and in the healthcare team the allies and the the guides um, rather than the other way around. So we're going to walk you through um, what is the patient-centered care plan. And we had sent this in a PDF version to Nicole, who I believe is um, passing it all along to you. And um, I'd love for you to think about as we go, you can unmute or you can use the chat and we'll have time, some time to talk at the end, but what would it look like to fill something like this out and, and include it as the part of the medical record? Um, for the patient that you're trying to amplify that voice or you're trying to amplify your own voice? Or do you already do this and what has your experience been? So the patient-centered care plan, the intent is that it is owned by the patient and the family and the caregiver. That this is not our, the healthcare team's care plan. This is the the person's care plan and they bring it around. They're the ones that live in this body 24 hours a day. And we see a person for 15 minutes once in a great while. So this is the care. This is a care plan that has the information that is important to them, not to necessarily to us, that it's a negotiated process and that it embraces complexity. And when I say complexity, I mean um, not necessarily complexity of the medical condition, but the complexity of the person's life, um, that the same solution, even if you're looking at the same exact mus neuromuscular disease, the way that it impacts a person's life and what's important to them is going to look different in every person. And so really seeing the person in front of us, not the disease in front of us. So because this is from the um, healthcare perspective, um, uh, we, we start off by having a medical um, summary. Um, and I will mention that as, as I'm talking, I'm going to be using the word patient because that's my kind of cultural context for thinking about, um, you know, your, your loved one um, for whom you're a caregiver that doesn't mean that you think of them as a patient, um, and it doesn't mean that you should think of them as a patient. Um, you know, as, as Amy's saying, they are a, a full person. Um, but if you hear me refer to him as a patient, that I acknowledging that's somewhat from my, um, my cultural context as a physician. So a medical summary, um, very basic, straightforward. Um, you really want to know about um, how, how to, uh, uh, get in touch with people, how, um, how to contact, um, and then just uh, right up front, uh, is there an emergency plan on file, um, allergies, medications, pretty much this just straightforward. Um, uh, so we can go to the next slide. And then um, again, this is just part of that, that first part. You really need that log of like everybody who is involved in your care. Now, uh, we don't have a 
we, we don't have medical records that talk to one another, as I'm sure you all are acutely aware. So sometimes you may have a caregiver in one system and, uh, I mean, a, a provider in one system, and you may not um, be able to send records to providers in other systems. So just documenting everybody who's involved, how to reach them, um, and uh, you know wh where to send information to, who should receive information. That's um, a nice organizational tool uh, to have up front. But then right away, um, we also want to uh, be able to give voice uh, to the um, family members, patients, and caregivers about who are the important people um, that we can talk to about care. Um, and this, uh, you know, this may involve community agencies, it might involve um, uh, aides in the home, it might involve uh, health members. Um, there's strict uh, legal rules about who you can disclose protected health information to. So this is a way of capturing um, the appropriate release forms if there's other people that need to be able to have access to that information. Um, so by asking who can we talk to you about your care, we can, uh, it's a reminder um, to get those release forms on file so that, you know, if it turns out um, that you are, you know, a caregiver to somebody who is not a direct next of kin um, or uh, that we have a release on file to be able to share the information with you. Yes, so in a lot of ways, that bottom section is so important. How many times have you tried to talk to a provider and the release expired and then you have to kind of, or like you sign the release with this office, but it didn't transfer over to this office. And that release process, it's one of those examples sometimes where HIPAA is meant to be protective of the patient, but it can really create barriers and um, coordinated team-based care. And so this is a way to have, um, it's a tool for the healthcare team, and it's also a tool for the caregivers and patients of saying it's, it's on file and we're keeping track of it and it's in one place. And it's inserting the caregiver in that really important voice as a member of the team, not an auxiliary peripheral kind of um, like nagging voice over in the corner that sometimes we feel like when we're in that caregiver role, um, but really a central member of the healthcare team. And another issue we've run into um, that, that you may face is that, um, that you know, you're, uh, you know, if, if you're a parent, um, you have full access to absolutely everything about uh, the patient up, up until that 18th birthday. And on the day that person eight, turns 18, the same things we told you yesterday, we are not legally allowed to tell you today until that release um, is signed. So sometimes getting those releases in place uh, before the 18th birthday um, can be really helpful so that there's not a gap in information that's coming to you. All right, so um, in this next part, we really think of this as the, the second part of the care plan because this uh, belongs to the patient, family, and caregivers. And it's really a snapshot. This is where um, you can help uh, paint a picture from a strengths-based perspective rather than a deficit perspective that um, sometimes can actually change the, uh, the care of the patient. Um, so uh, we encourage you to write down what you want that healthcare team um, to know. I've had patients say um, that they want the healthcare team to know that it's hard for them to process auditory information. Um, uh, or uh, I had one patient tell me that she was deaf in her left ear. Could I please make sure that I was speaking uh, to her right ear? Like things that should be intuitively obvious, but, but aren't um, to, to the care team. And so when they're written out, especially um, as a way to refer to in a stressful situation or when you're seeing many patients in a day, that can be, that can be really help, um, helpful. And then there, we, there's also Can a spot. I interrupt you, yeah. Laura, yeah. for a moment. So this, um, this first part, I think, is the most magical part of the entire care plan. Like, who are you as a person? I use this box um, to kind of 
pull people out of being a patient and into being a person that's interacting with the healthcare team with other people. Um, and so the, the, as a, I'm a social worker and as a social worker, I'm, I'm very in tune with the ways that the medical environment that we are, um, as anybody with a complex medical condition is at the risk of being traumatized and re-traumatized and being aware of what can reduce the likelihood of this being a traumatic experience. And so sometimes I, um, I have pieces of information in here that doesn't seem like it has anything to do with a medical presentation, like the joy of um, playing the piano. And and then uh, noticing when a patient's really nervous about a conversation or a procedure or even just undressing and putting the Johnny on, that seems basic, but that can be really scary. Um, you know, would it be helpful? I noticed that you're, you play piano. Would it be helpful if we just played some piano music while, while you're, you know, getting changed? And what a difference that makes, not just for the person to feel known and heard and recognized, but to actually dissipate that anxiety. Um, so that, that box can be any information that is important to who the person is. And, and you'll notice it's a lot bigger than the box of what my provider wants my care team to know. So the other interesting part of this uh, section of the care plan is this urgent plan of care, which is really like, do you have any recommendations for how the healthcare team should respond if you are in a crisis? Um, and as a physician, I think about the urgent plan of care as the medical interventions that I need to enact immediately. This is an urgent plan of care that really is, how, am I, how should I interact with the humans on the other side, right? The patients, the families and the caregivers um, if, we're, if they're in a crisis. So this might be a place where you would say, you know, if, um, if we are having a medical emergency, um, I recommend that my care team talk to the name of the caregiver as, as opposed to the patient potentially. Or um, if, uh, if we are in a, uh, you know, a medical crisis, I need you to speak slowly and spell out names or phone numbers that you want me to contact. You know, very, very practical tips. Um, but it also can be, uh, be advice for the care team in terms of how to connect with you um, emotionally um, or, or psychologically. Uh, you know, a long, a long time ago, um, Amy and I shared a patient who in this particular section said that, you know, if I appear to be in crisis and I'm yelling and being very direct and angry at you or swearing at your staff, it's okay to hang up on me. Um, and call me back in five minutes and tell me that I was out of control. Now, that was shocking. I mean, never, ever, ever would a anybody in a medical staff office hang up on a patient, especially one that seemed out of control. But the patient was really saying, like, sometimes I get overwhelmed and I scream and yell and I'm really inappropriate. And this is how I want you, my care team, um, to, to steer me back on track. Um, you know, and in this particular case, it was somebody with uh, behavioral health concerns, but it's still interesting to know that patients will give the care team permission to act potentially differently than they normally would once their voice is heard in, in this area. And it also kind of helped the team feel like this isn't personal. This isn't about like this person is swearing at me, um, but this is a signal of being really overwhelmed. Um, and so this part of the care plan is really pushing the healthcare team to use a whole person approach and um, sort of be planning for how the patient would like to be treated and responded to um, in a very sort of patient driven way rather than, um, you know, reacting to crisis. Like we can't, we, if we know something's going to happen, we can be proactive. 
Um, so there's a comment in the chat that I just want to pause for a moment. Somebody, um, Veronica, said this can be modeled in a school setting and help transition from one grade to another. And I love that comment because actually a lot of this, I was a school social worker before I worked in the healthcare setting. And um, some of this came from a, a model that I saw from a from somebody that was a mentor to me who did student-led IEP meetings. And the student got up in front of the team and said, um, this is what I'm really good at and this is what I really need help with. And it changed the entire conversation of the, of the school. Like it, those meetings can be really problem saturated and really um, overwhelming for a kid to listen to the, themselves talked about in this way as if they're not there. And that's actually was like the birth of this whole idea was like that tool that the student taking control of that conversation um, changed the whole conversation. Everybody was kind of like, yes, that is what we want to help you with. Um, and that like, can we do this in the healthcare setting too? So thank you for that comment. So in the, <clears throat> in the third part of the care plan, we want to capture goals. And one of the things um, that I've learned is that the patient goals and the provider goals are, are not the same. Um, for example, if I'm treating somebody with diabetes, I will say, you know, my goal is for their hemoglobin A1C, this lab test, you know, I, I want them to be less than, than eight. Um, that is an incredibly non-meaningful sentence uh, to many of the patients that I currently work with. Um, they don't know what that, what a lab test is. And even if they did, like, why is that a goal? Like it has no bearing on their life. But I've also worked with patients who have said, you know, my granddaughter just turned six, you know, it, I can't wait to see her, her high school graduation. Um, you know, set, really setting that, that long-term goal, opening the conversation for me to say like, I also share that goal of having you um, be there at your, your granddaughter's high school graduation uh, in you know, 10 years. Therefore, um, because I want to get you to that goal, I need to help you work on your health issues now that are gonna prevent a heart attack in five years. And that's how we're gonna engage on talking about your diabetes. Um, and so it really helps connect uh, me to what the patient's framework is um, from the provider framework. Likewise, I want to have the transparency and clarity with patients about what my goals are as a provider because I owe it to the patients the, and the families and the caregivers to give my very best advice um, about what I see as the, as the goals of medical care. Um, but by setting it down on a piece of paper and and as uh, uh, Amy and I have been thinking this, you know, caregivers may have different goals than the patients. You may need three columns of patient goals, caregiver goals, and provider goals. But as setting this down on a piece of paper and, and looking at them kind of as equally weighted, um, and then the idea that together we will work as a team to make a negotiated goal. And that negotiated goal, you know, does not let one set of goals, um, you know, rise above the other, but it's how is the team going to work together to get to that negotiated goal? What's the action plan going to be? Let's, let's um, break things down into really actionable, short-term, small steps. Who's going to be responsible for that? Um, and what time frame are we going to accomplish that in? So if I'm working with somebody, let's say, um, who's having, um, you know, they, they say that their goal is they'd like to be able to walk around the block once a day. Um, but right now they're really just sitting in their chair. Um, uh, you know, I've worked with uh, patients with arthritis who I really need to, to make sure that they can get up and move. We might say, okay, the long-term goal is, is to walk around the block um, my goal is that you're moving more, you, your goal is walk around the block. Great, let's do that. What's the very first small step you can take? So I had a patient tell me like, she wants to be able to walk out and get the mail from her own mailbox um, once a day. Great, let's write that down. That's gonna be our negotiated goal, get the mailbox. What's the time, um, what's the action? The action is when the mail comes, 
She's going to walk out to the mailbox and, and walk back. Who's responsible? In this case, uh, my patient decided she was going to be responsible for that. And what was the time frame? And the time frame was she wanted to do this, you know, um, you know, start small. Maybe she wouldn't do it every day. But when we met back in three months, she wanted to be doing it most days of the week. So th that's what we put into her action plan. Amy, what are your comments? Well, so we thought we would um, kind of give a list of, you know, pieces that we see that come into play of being an activated patient in an activated, um, in the role of caregiver, an ally. Uh, and so we'd love to spend some time talking about these bullet points and um, hear from you about what, you know, what are your tips and tricks? How, what has worked for you? Have you had success trying to do this in, in your experience in the healthcare team, if you're comfortable um, either to unmute or to use the chat? Um, so some of these pieces would be, you know, coming prepared with an agenda that prioritizes concerns. Uh, and so oftentimes we're, when we're in training with, with healthcare teams and with physicians in training, um, we do lots of work on agenda setting. And what, what they have found often is that the last thing that comes up is often the most important thing to um, the patient or the or the family in the room, um, and so if you're if you're sort of engaging in the same process of like what's the most important thing, it might not be the most important thing. It might not even be the reason for the visit, but if that's what you want to get out of the visit, is stating that right up front so that the time that you have together can be uh, sort of planned around that, along with a list of questions. Um, questions for that you sort of been lingering about. I'm, I'm a big note taker. So there mine come to me like at two in the morning. Um, so like you sort of writing them down so that I'm not like in the moment, like I, I had a question and I just can't think of what it is. I'll think of it. And then I've missed my, my moment of opportunity. Um, Using, using something like a care plan. And, and this is where we're really interested to hear from you is what, what, how do you think your healthcare team would respond to a document like the one that we just went through? Um, but really the, the most important part, it shifts most important part might actually be the goals. Um, what are the, you know, what are the goals and how can the healthcare team frame the work that, the, that you all do together around those goals? Um, and then when those come up, being really transparent about lim limitations and barriers, whether it's, you know, there's lots of um, ways that the healthcare system makes it really difficult to engage in healthcare. And so what, you know, being, you know, sort of pointing those out because oftentimes with the healthcare team, like that phrase, I'm always reminded of the what the fish can't describe the water it swims in. You know, we can't even see because we're working in healthcare, how difficult it can be just to like get the lab when the lab is across campus and it's pouring out or um, insurance restrictions get in the way if something gets charged twice on the same day um, things like that. So just being, being upfront about them, um, taking notes. Uh, so um, I, I have this distinct memory actually of uh, my dad in a visit um, sort of like with a notebook and being very like nodding along as if he had any idea what the, phys the physician was describing mitochondria in a cell and he was nodding along and writing it down and he got home and was like in his Merriam-Webster's dictionary looking up mitochondria. Um, and so I don't mean notes in the, in the sense that like like it, it taking the place of patient literacy, um, but more notes like now we have smartphones, we can, we can use the record function and do it that way and then listen to it later to be able to like slow it down and understand what, what all was said. Um, and then we've had a recent um, paradigm shift recently of, of more and more EMRs, elect, electronic medical records having, patients having a more transparent access to the medical record and taking advantage of that and seeing how the visit is written up, what the instructions are. Is that the same as what you thought they were going to be? Um, and 
in creating, you know, more communication between the caregiver and the patient and the team um, because the caregiver and patient are the experts really keeping that frame, that frame in mind. So um, with that, with that, we thought we would pause and um, take our last five minutes together today to um, wonder how, whether you want to use the chat or on mute, um, how does this resonate with you and what have you been your experiences? Thank you, um, Amy and Dr. Council. I wanted to just highlight something that was in the chat because I'm not sure if all of our attendees were looking in the chat and I know some of them are on the phone, um, but we had Jeff type in, you know, setting goals when the condition is degener degenerative is difficult. How do you work around that without feeling disappointed every time a goal becomes unattainable? And um, Dr. Laura Council typed in that she would love to hear from other attendees. So if, um, if all of you are on the line and if you would like to click in and type in in the chat, you know, how do you um, work around that feeling without being disappointed? We would love to hear your thoughts and comments on that. And, and Dr. Council said that um, in palliative care, we often set emotional goals rather than functional goals. Um, the example given was I want to connect again with my friend from high school. I want to make a recording about an experience I had. Um, so something, something to that. So if any of them, if anyone listening would like to chat in, please do so. And Veronica also typed in that um, being consistent uh, with school communication is great also for, for um, teachers and so forth. So clear communication is great with that as well. Let me say just a, a couple other words about goals. <clears throat> the interesting thing about goals is that they change. And so one of the nuances of making a care plan like this is that we talk about um, being goal oriented as if once you've made that goal, it's in stone, like we've written it down for all time and space. I will say that um, part of making a goal, clear, like part of acting on a goal often clarifies what the real goal was. Um, you know, and so I can't tell you the number of times when I ask about, you know, how is this goal going? And then the other person responds like, oh, yeah, that actually wasn't my goal. Um, you know, like I started to do that or I started to do that action. And then I realized like that, that wasn't what was truly important to me. And so even the act of setting goals, working on them, um, and then coming back uh, kind of uncovers uh, deeper goals. And so when there is a degenerative condition, which I personally don't have a lot of experience working with as a physician, but I do work um, in palliative care and, and I don't mean to conflate that they are mm -hmm. at all related. I'm just trying to say, a, you know, how, how I think about this. So um, like in palliative care, uh, you know, it is normal for goals of care to really change over time um, because the context of the medical condition and the sort of emotional place where the family and the caregiver are changes over time. And so the care plan is not meant to be um, a document that like you write once, it's meant to be something that you're constantly coming back to and using it as a tool to share with the medical team that goals are changing. Um, mm -hmm. over time. And you don't have to check something off in order to move on. And I'm sure, Amy, you can validate this. I know a lot of our families, they have a, a very long diagnostic journey and it, it wanes and varies from month to season to age. And um, it's a constant up and down winding road. Um, what muscular dystrophy is is definitely it um, is, has its ups and downs. So yes, I can honestly say that I've worked, I've seen a lot of our families with their goals that have changed and and been impacted with when they do feel better and when they're having a you know when they're having a rough time. Yeah, I I think that um, this is this is a little bit coming from my social worker hat and a little bit coming from my uh, personal experience hat. But with a condition that is uh, degenerative. There is a grief process every time those goals have to change. And so sometimes it, it can be what is needed in the moment just to acknowledge the grief that has to go along with giving yet another um, kind of 
part of who we are up or, or having to adapt that part of our personhood yet again. And so to be able to say like what, just to pause and acknowledge that this is, this is loss and this is um, also, there's going to be a silver lining. And we found that silver lining before last time we had to adapt to change and um, just creating space to acknowledge that. I think oftentimes the healthcare team is so action oriented that we don't pause and and kind of make space for grief. Mm-hmm. We had someone type in that says, how can I help my 11-year-old understand that he can't get back what he has lost and to focus on what he can do only to lose that also? I know that's a very, very um, common situation with a lot of our kids. Yeah. Yeah. Um, again, this is more coming from my personal hat. I think the... Ha- being surrounded by people who are older than him who have gone through this because the thing about about any condition is that if you don't have it you don't get it and you won't get it to the extent that somebody who does um, what they can offer. And so in a lot of ways, it's like, how can he maybe be connected to to role models that have been not necessarily in the same condition or lost in the same way, but people that get it, that can say, I've been there. And, and then how they got through it and kind of showing how that, what that looks like and how that works. Um, and just creating space again to acknowledge that there's, how adaptable he is, that he's creating new goals and that he's constantly figuring out how to maximize what he's good at. Um, Really important part of like identity process, which is right the stage that he's starting to enter. Right, And, and to highlight what you're saying is that not all goals are functional. Some of the goals, so some of the goals might be I want to be an, I want to be adaptable so that whatever happens next, that's, you know, unknown and unpredictable, I can deal with it. Or I want to um, have less anxiety when something about a medical condition, I'm experiencing changes. Um, Those are also, you know, very, very legitimate goals as well. Yeah. Um, so there are a few questions here about getting copies of the care plan and the slides, and I did send them to Nicole, and Nicole, please feel free to pass them out liberally, um, and our uh, email addresses are also available uh, if anybody would like to reach out offline, but thank you for your time today. This is, um, again, really enjoyable for, for Laura and I to participate in with you. Thank you guys for being with us today. Thank you. Um, Oh, we did get one last uh, question in, and I just want to touch base with that real quick. They said that um, I'm a 72 year old with IBM. It's hard to set goals and plans when most doctors, researchers don't know much about it or how to help. How can I help manage creating a team? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, I, Laura, you can speak to this from the doctor perspective, but from the perspective of like, this is such a great example of you are the expert, you know more, you could potentially, um, you know, know a lot more about uh, what it's like to live with this condition than your team does. And really um, sort of creating that space to amplify that expertise um, and being really explicit about what you're looking for from your doctors when, if they don't have the answers. Uh, or they don't have the, you know, the solution. And doctors um, are really frightened when they feel alone. And often when you have something very complex, um, unknown, ill-defined, you know, that we can't look up easily, you know, it can be anxiety provoking. Now, I don't expect that your doctors are going to say that to you in, in any way, but even knowing that you're on a team um, helps your caregivers just the way that it helps you. So, you know, if a, if you are letting your caregiver that your um, care providers, I mean, if you're letting your care providers know that like, you know, I have this person at this institution taking care of this problem and this is their phone number. And I have this other person taking care of this entirely different issue at this institution. And this is their phone number. Look, I've written it down on this piece of paper for you. Do you want to be on my team? Like, 
uh, you know, that actually starts to create a community that relieves the anxiety of the people providing the care and really rallies them around connecting with one another. Again, uh, somebody mentioned, you know, how disconnected our kids have been through COVID, how we've all been through COVID, but your care, your care providers are also quite disconnected from each other. They're not bumping into each other in break rooms um, the, the way they used to, or, you know, going to meetings um, together the way they used to. So, uh, th this idea that, that you as the patient are, are bringing a team together is really quite powerful, especially right now. That's very well said. Thank you both for your time today. We definitely appreciate it and um, have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.